So let's go to the investments cli climate in Botswana. What does Botswana has to offer that you as um, a person managing uh, funds from different sectors, you actually say this is why one would have to come to Botswana apart from the rest of Af uh, Southern Africa? So Botswana has many attributes that make it an interesting place. Yeah. One, it's in the center of SADC, you know. So, you know, SAD, so what it means is basically when you make investments in SADC or when you make investments in Botswana, you gear them to, in, to growing within SADC, almost like on a high, hub and spoke basis. So center of SADC is becoming more and more important, especially if you're looking forward now with what is happening with the airlines. Uh, so you're seeing like uh, national airlines in Botswana is now also adopting a hub and spoke model. Mm. So now I can fly to almost anywhere in SADC within an hour. Oh, okay. It, and it will be like that. Uh, in fact, almost every capital by end of this year or mid next year, mm. I'll be able to go to Luanda, uh, uh, Lusaka, Maputo, mm. Johannesburg, Harare, Vindu within an hour. Okay, that's so that's, that, that would be ideal. So that, that, that's one principal attribute that Botswana has. The second one is, uh, is the free flow of money. Mm. Botswana has no ex -con, exchange control. Exchange control. Mm. It's a key factor when you have to move capital quickly. Mm. Uh, the challenge, of course, is moving capital out of South, Southern African countries back into Botswana. Mm. But the easier thing is once your capital goes into South Africa and it goes in as equity, mm. it's easier to release it as equity back to Botswana. Mm. So ex ex exchange controls, are, I think, are one of the fundamental attributes that, uh, that Botswana has. And it has a stable currency underpinning mm. that. So mm. our currency is very stable and it enables us to have sort of a forecasting model that has less variables in it when it comes to the movement or fluctuations in currency. You know, and we appreciate that historically, most of our currencies in Africa have always been depreciating against the U.S. dollar. But now we have the yuan uh, out of China, which has been extremely steady. Mm -hmm. So what we tend to do is benchmark our currency against the yuan rather than against the U.S. dollar. And that helps us markedly in managing our, our forecasts in terms of how our currency will do. Because you can always buy yuan. Mm -hmm. You don't need to buy a U.S. dollar anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that helps us. And then uh, I mean, I mean, a couple of other things are so soft issue, security is key. Mm. Uh, but before that, I mean, one macro issue is inflation. Mm. Uh, Botswana has demonstrated to be adept at managing inflation. Mm. Uh, our, our inflation range is between, uh, has been between 2.8, I think, and 6%. Mm. If you go back over the last five, seven years, that has been fundamental for making investments in Botswana. You know that you can at least, at least you have a fairly good chance that the, the cost of your investment or the equity return on your investment will not be depreciated by inflation. Uh, or you have to find ways and means of managing inflationary risk within your investments. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a, a, another key, key aspect. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, security. Botswana is a very secure place to live in. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's one of the best places to live, not just in Africa, but on the planet. Healthcare is, is good. Education is good. So even when you bring in professionals, into investment professionals, it's easier. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to give up or sacrifice or feel like they're sacrificing uh, what is deemed uh, first world uh, uh, comfort mm -hmm. to come and live, live here. Yeah, I, I think those, and of course, I, I think uh, one of the other key things is that policy framework is relatively stable. Mm -hmm. So there are no um, major, you can, you can predict with certainty mm -hmm. uh, that there will be no major changes in, in, poli in uh, macroeconomic policy mm -hmm. uh, from the government. Uh, and it's it's been like that for a, for a long, and even even if they are, they are not fundamental. So your, your policy chain, your your policy framework, is fairly stable. So let's look at opportunities now. Where are the opportunities? Say, yeah, 
clients, your clients are going to hear you talk and say, uh, this, oh, you, this climate that you've painted is a rosy climate. Where are the opportunities? So what sectors are, are very viable in Botswana that you would wish if we had so much money, you could pour or investors should come and pour money into this? So for, for us, Botswana is like, a, is like an airport. You come through Botswana mm. uh, with an airport hotel. You live at the, at the airport or the airport hotel in order for you to, to do things around, in and around Botswana. Mm. So I, I tend to see uh, investments in Botswana in two forms. One is around the opportunities within Botswana, which are fundamentally and have always been around the supply chain with respect to, in, to infrastructure. So we, for example, in Botswana, we focused on what we call primary industry investments, mm. which were uh, sectors that were significantly correlated to GDP growth. Mm. Uh, and if you look at Botswana as a developing nation, what were those areas? It was fundamentally infrastructure, mm -hmm. agriculture related, agriculture related industries, mining related industries. And of course, in the infrastructure, you can have anything. You had roads, you had telecoms, you have ICT, uh, all those things that help the economy to grow. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, we, we didn't like primary industry, uh, primary industry sectors, we so we tended to focus more on the secondary industry sectors yeah, around agriculture, uh, because that's what everybody in this country is involved in. And then finally, underpinning all of this was financial, financial services. But what we also tended to look at were those things in financial services that reduce the friction of transactions. So, because, you know, Botswana is a huge country, very few people. And one of the things that we've tended to see is that financial services succeeds where in this country where you are able to scale up and you have to move money fairly quickly within between people and distances with very little friction. So again, we found some very niche and interesting areas in those spaces. And then finally, the, the one big area of growth that we've seen has been logistics. Mm -hmm. And logistics has been, and it follows infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, logistics is, industry has been great. Now, if you look at all those sectors, they are all linked to the region. They are all links to, they all link Botswana to the region. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives you, they give you a platform to now go into the region, having invested in Botswana, mm -hmm. because those are the things that bring the region closer to, to Botswana. Botswana. So from an individual, now maybe individual young people who are in this country are, going, are, are hearing this advice. What should they do to prepare themselves for to be successful, to be the same stage that you are? Perhaps what 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 would you tell a young Botswana, the investor of Botswana, who is just graduating and say, "I want to be like you. Uh, you have all this experience and uh, skills. How should I position myself to be to be also successful?" Yeah. It's a difficult one because you know one of the other things that Botswana has is a large population of graduates, unemployed graduates, so which is also a bit of a challenge. Um, because much as the opportunities for growth have been there to absorb, so we've got a very large pool of highly talented, educated young Botswana. Some of, and most of them have been educated from around the world, from Australia, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, um, you name it, Japan, they've, they've, they've been there, they've got that. Yeah. So for a, a young a graduate in, in Botswana, I, I tend to say you need to be resourceful. You need to look at Botswana not just as a platform or a home for you to work, but as a platform for you to leverage to work in other parts of the region in order to gain your experience, because that's what I had to do. I had to leave Botswana, to live in other parts of the region in order to gain experience so I could come back and grow a business here. Uh, so the world, I would also say to them, the world has changed. The world requires you to not only be resourceful in terms of what you know, but also resourceful in terms of how you can get from where you are to where you need to get to. 
And it doesn't mean sitting here in this country. It means getting out, going to Mozambique, which has the higher, fastest growing infrastructure requirements in the region, with the least amount of, uh, how do you say it, the least amount of uh, educated capacity. Mm. So you need to be smart to sit down, look at what is growing where, in what part of the world, especially within the region, and how you can leverage or get access to those markets. Because from there, you can then you can get the skill that you need in order to leverage that. So you're talking about flexibility and willingness to take risk and leave the country and go out there and acquire experience in addition to your education. So you can then bring that experience from other regional countries, then you bring it and apply it here yeah. and as a sort of springboard. Well, you don't even come back. You can even stay there. You can oh, go to Mozambique. Okay. Uh, because the, the opportunities are in, in all these areas. They are not just here, but Botswana provides us with a base, mm. and a very strong base for us to be able to leverage. Okay. So moving on to drawbacks, what do you see as challenges this country is facing uh, that probably uh, also, maybe the region, not just focus on this country, unless we, 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 we think there are challenges there, but what are the problems that you see in Southern Africa that, that needs to be fixed to make sure Southern Africa, including Botswana, moves forward? It's, it's interesting. Uh, other parts of the world have, have, a, have a challenge because they don't have a young population, whereas in our parts of the world we have a challenge because our population is dominated by young people. Mm -hmm. uh, our challenge is that we are not giving uh, enough opportunities to young people to grow. We're not giving them the opportunity to become part of the, re of the regional and even country economy. Predominantly because I think the, the business model is geared more towards a government does pro policy private sector does jobs, which doesn't work for us here, it's never worked. That's my view. Uh, and one of the things we have seen, which I believe has been, uh, uh, has significantly contributed to the success of Botswana over the years, mm -hmm. has been a, a, a socialist model where government does jobs and policy private sector follow because our private sector has never been big enough mm. to be able to absorb the demand for jobs the demand for or the supply rather than the demand the supply of, of uh, labor and the supply of skill our private sector has never been big enough mm -hmm. so government has been in a position where it has taken risk mm. which was if you aggregate the value of that risk was significantly higher than the than the, the private sector economy. So mm -hmm. the private sector economy could not absorb that, absorb risk. that risk. So government then used to do that. I'll give you an example. When you go from 1969 to 19, to 2000 and maybe 2020, 2021, 20, the biggest investor in mining services in Botswana was government, or in, mine, in mining mm -hmm. was the government. And that invest, those investments were huge. They were highly risky, and, but they needed somebody. And as a function of that, the mining sector, uh, outside of government sector, um, or public sector, became the largest employer. Mm. So there's a reason for that, you know. And, and for me, it was quite obvious why that, that should be the case. Um, so I, 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 I see that as an opportunity in order to create uh, opportunity for young people to get access to, uh, to a life that will uh, give them purpose. Uh, secondly, I think the, the, the biggest challenge for Botswana is infrastructure. Mm. Uh, I think we've overcome to a significant extent the digital barrier. I think we have sort of overcome it. Now we need to make it work. Mm. Uh, so we're still at the basic level in terms of provision of digital services. But again, that infrastructure is what will also open the door for young people. 
So we need to lower the cost of digital infrastructure, the cost of access to digital mm. infrastructure, to make it easier to create, uh, to create a sustainable economy within the, yeah, within the digital infrastructure framework. Mm. Um, I, I see that as probably one of the, the, the biggest solutions. And then f I think finally the cost of finance in our markets, which is also a function of the fact that it's a supply and demand issue. Mm. But the, the cost of risk uh, capital in our markets is so high that it prohibits the, the startup industry from growing. Uh, people need to be able to grow and for you to be able to set up a new business, you go to your uncle, your uncle is too expensive for him because his money, his risk, his savings uh, are, are important for him because there is no other. You would have to be required to pay a high premium for it. Mm -hmm. So then maybe high young people would then say, okay, so how am I expected to succeed? And then you said, okay, you can try <coughs> looking at um, at it regionally and go where opportunities are rather than to wait for the opportunities to, to come, come to you. Yeah. Uh, be flexible, pretty much that's what you're telling young yeah. people. Then uh, one would then say, is it useful for me to go to higher education now that you are telling me I can go outside the country? Should I then go and spend three years at the University of Botswana? Is, is it useful? What would you say for success, for, for, for the, what underpins success for young Botswana uh, people who are going to be yeah. listening to this. It's, inter it's interesting because my son says to me, mm. says that to me, why do I need to go to university? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, Bill Gates didn't go to university. Mm. You know? So I said mm. to him, yeah, but how many Bill Gates are there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, I, I, I'm I'm ambivalent about mm. university, to mm. be quite okay. honest. Mm. Okay. I, I just feel that you need to be able to, I would say you need to find the skill that you okay. need. You need to go where you can get the skill that you need mm. in order to enable you to compete. Because in this life, all we do is compete, right? We don't, we, we don't do anything else, we compete. So for you to compete, you need the tools. And they may not necessarily be tools you get from university. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I, I would say to, to, to anybody uh, after high school, it's up to you. Mm. You need to find this. You can sit on your laptop and pick up two courses mm. that you believe teach you how to code because you want to code. Mm. And after that, you can work anywhere in the world because you can code in Python or whatever. But now you can code. So you can, and you don't need to go anywhere. You, because you can code, you can get the job directly from the internet. Mm. And code and get paid, right? You didn't have to go to university to do that. Let me close by this question around technology. Because AI is coming, and there are many technologies that are sprawling around. Mm. Obviously, some of them are positive, some of them are negative. But we want to look at how the young people in this region and including Botswana can capitalize on the sprawling technologies to further themselves. Uh, and which ones, or what should you tell young people? I, I wouldn't give you a direction. What would you want to say about AI and technology in relation to success? Yeah. I think there's, there's two aspects to it. There's, there's tech to policy makers and how they deal with it. And there's tech to young people. I, I think Policy makers need to be very wary about how they, they, they monitor and manage and regulate the technology framework. Uh, and unfortunately for us, in our parts of the world, we don't know. In fact, not just for us here. I, I look at the responses of politicians around the world. They don't know what to do mm -hmm. with things like AI. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are not seeing the picture of what AI is about. And so they are not able to, uh, to, to create a model that says this is how we need to manage this, this, yeah. uh, this animal. And when it comes here, uh, our people tend to see it as so far-fetched, so uh, extraordinary, 
that it's, a, it's something that must just open our doors and let it come in without necessarily understanding what that picture will be. And it's, I, I, I am one of those people who try to spend time to understand something first that is here so that I can, I can forecast with internet retail, mm-hmm. the Amazons of this world, etc. It world. has destroyed, they have destroyed jobs significantly, mm-hmm. in my view. And I think, having looked at some of the data, I think it's become quite evident, even in the U.S., how much they've decimated the retail landscape. Mm-hmm. So it, can, it has not been good. Uh, but we have not done that research here to say, is that the kind of picture that we want here? Do we want uh, a, a retail environment, for example, where uh, I don't need checkout ladies? I just go and I buy. What happens to those checkout ladies? Mm-hmm. Where do they go to? Mm-hmm. Is it, is it a real, and for business, is it a real, a real, is it a real saving to not have that kind of human capacity? Uh, and when you look at uh, these companies, for example, in the retail space that have been using these online checkouts or, or just the checkouts at the supermarket, uh, it has not been a real saving. So. But it has appeared to be a real, but it has not been a saving. Mm-hmm. But what it has done is it has killed jobs that ordinarily would be for people who cannot get jobs anywhere else. So, I, I, you know, this picture mm-hmm. is a picture that five years from now, and I'm, we're already seeing the picture already in the U.S. and in Europe, where people don't like the, the other jobs are decimated. Is that the future we want for our kids? I don't think so. So... I, I, see, I, I see a lot of changes in the world that are not necessarily to the betterment of the lives of young people in, in our economies. And I, I see that also those changes requiring a special brand of leadership that is in tune with tech, uh, research, uh, market analysis, economics, Mm-hmm. Bring that in, yeah, and that forges tech and macro and micro issues <clears throat> to be able to develop the, re- the requisite framework for running some of our country in order to give our young people a chance. Uh, I see that there's a huge gap there. That's my worry. Can you list your principles of success to someone who's going to hear you, who is emulating a young person out there, wants to be like you? What are your principles of success? So, it's a, it's a, that's an interesting question because I get asked it all the time. Mm. And I, I, something shaped my life when I was very, very young. Uh, there was a brand when I was growing up called No Fear. Uh, and and no, no Fear was a brand. I don't know whether you guys remember it. And I remember buying a t-shirt. At the time, it just looked cool. Mm. And it said at the back, it was a No Fear brand. At the back, it said, if you are not sitting on the edge, you are taking too much space. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's kind of shaped my life okay. because that's uh, I, I've learned to to not worry about risk <clears throat> because everything we do is risk. But just to try and just to try and calculate the amount of risk I'm comfortable to live with, but to understand that everything that I do is risky and accept that. There will always always be risk around me. So I'm very comfortable in a risky environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, My business requires me to take risks every day. And then my final one is success is not permanent. Neither is failure. Mm -hmm. So that's that's, uh, that's how we live our lives here. And I think uh, so far, you know, it teaches you to, 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 it teaches you to accept when you failed but also to learn to get up and so there you had it take risk success is not a straight line so basically those two are, are for me are, okay. are the fundamental success is really a straight line if you are not sitting on the edge you are wasting too, you are taking up too much space and everything sort of revolves re- revolves around that those okay. philosophies